the chant we had just now on aging, illness, and death was precisely the reflection that led Prince Siddhartha to leave home and go away into the wilderness. Because they realized that even though he had youth and power, wealth, beauty, sensual pleasures of all kinds, still it was going to end. And he knew that no matter how good it got, the question was, well, was it, what was he going to do in order to keep it going when it started to slip from his grasp? We see this all around us, people with wealth who suddenly feel their wealth is slipping out of their grasp. And the question is, okay, what did they do to get the wealth to begin with? And what are they going to do in order to maintain it? And sometimes you start stoop to some pretty low things. The same with power. And all the other delusions that we put ourselves through around youth and beauty and our sensual pleasures. And the question is, what happens when those things leave you? And there's a huge sense of emptiness. Not only a sense of loss, but a sense of how empty those things were all along. And then you look back on what did you do in order to maintain those empty things? That was why he couldn't stand to stay in the palace. He had to get out. And so he recommended that, after he gained awakening, he recommended that everybody think on these topics. Every day, he said, whether you're a lay person or ordained man or woman, these are the reflections that keep everything in perspective. When you're out in daily life, it's so easy to lose perspective. So it's not just a matter of you know, what techniques you do in order to maintain mindfulness and maintain your attention on the breath, but it's also having a perspective on exactly how important are the things that are happening around you. And a realization that's very easy to get sucked in to the narratives of the day. And to believe a lot of the assumptions that are being held by the people all around you. Because when you hang around certain groups of people, you tend to pick up their ways of looking at things, their ways of believing, the kind of the shorthand assumptions that everybody has, that we tend to blind ourselves to because everybody has them. They become so common that they don't seem remarkable. But if you learn how to mentally step out of those assumptions, you begin to realize how ridiculous a lot of those assumptions are. So that's probably the most important thing you can take back with you when you leave a place like this, is the whole question of perspective. And doing whatever you can, whatever reflections you can, in order to not get sucked into the beliefs that tell you that okay, youth, beauty, wealth, power are important things. Or the activities of the, the young, the beautiful, the powerful, and the wealthy are worthy of your interest. You've got to keep the Buddha's reflections in mind. And while you're staying here, these are the reflections that help keep you here. And by here means not only the place of the monastery, but also right here at the breath. Because it's so easy to get caught up in the narratives that you spin about well, how about if this happened? Or how about if that happened? Or I wish that had happened. I wish this had happened. Because that's the mind creating worlds for itself right here and now. And again, the Buddha reminds you, no matter how wonderful the world, it all comes down to this, aging, illness, death, separation. And then there's a whole issue of karma. Okay, what did you do in order to maintain those things before they left you? Because that's what you'll be left with, is the the results of your actions, the imprint that they leave on the mind, and then what they create for you. Here in the West, we tend to have trouble with the Buddha's teachings on rebirth. But it's not this, Buddha wasn't the sort of person who would teach things just because other Indians believed them at that time. He saw through his own practice that this was an aspect of truth that is useful to reflect on. 
We all know the story about the handful of leaves. He goes into the forest, picks up a handful of leaves, and asks the monks, okay, which is more, the leaves in my hand or the leaves up there in the trees? Well, of course, the leaves in the trees are much more than the leaves in his hand. He said the leaves in the trees are, can be compared to what he came to realize in the course of his awakening. The leaves in his hand are what he taught. And the reason he taught it was because it was useful for putting an end to suffering. So, as I said, he wasn't the sort of person that would teach things just because other people believed them. They were, it was a really useful truth. In the sense that you reflect, okay, what you're doing with your mind, the worlds that you create with your mind, become the worlds that you're going to have to live in. And they all end in aging, illness, and death. And so you use the reflection on aging, illness, and death. Just like the, the narratives you create with your mind, these are, in the Buddhist technical terms, these are sankaras, they're mental fabrications. Okay, if the mind is going to fabricate, well, you use mental fabrications to bring them back to where, they sh where the mind should be. Reflect on no matter how good it gets, you could become president of the United States and have all the power in the world. And then what happens? Okay, you tend to abuse the power. You tend to get carried away. You tend to get swollen up, as we see happening so often. And then what are you left with? Memories of what used to be, and then that huge burden of karma that you're carrying around. So it's part of the Buddha's wisdom that, okay, if, if sankaras, this process of mental fabrication, is a problem, the only way to get out of it is not just to tell yourself to stop thinking, it's to tell yourself, well, start thinking in ways that are useful, that bring the mind back to the path. Because when he analyzed suffering in, the first, in his first sermon, okay, it comes down to cling to the aggregates. In the second sermon, he okay, brings the aggregates back again, but now it's a as topics of reflection. And the process of reflection itself is a mental fabrication. So to take these things apart, exactly what in there is you or yours that you can really hold on to, that you can really find as any substance? Well, there's nothing. So you sort of peel these things away. You use the process of fabrication to peel away your attachment to fabrications. You use the process of fabrication to create states of concentration in the mind. That's what the path is. It's a type of fabrication, but it's skillful fabrication. There are certain aspects of the Buddha's teachings that are non-dual, but this, when you're getting on the path, dualism is very important. Okay, there are skillful ways of thinking and unskillful ways of thinking. So you learn to encourage the skillful ones and then drop the unskillful ones. See how far the skillful ones take you, okay, then you can let things go. The Buddha talked about the sort of turning point in his path. When he finally got on the right path, and one of the first steps was just to sit and look at his thinking processes. Okay, which ones were skillful that didn't lead to harm, and which ones are unskillful that did lead to harm. If he found that a thinking process was unskillful, he did what he could to check it. Okay, the activity of checking it, that's, that's a kind of thinking process as well. As for skillful thoughts, okay, he allowed himself free reign, just to make, just kept mindful of them, to make sure that they didn't start going out of bounds. And then he began to realize, okay, even skillful thinking can tire the mind. Okay, that's when the mind is ready to settle down. So when we come to the meditation. It's not just a pro activity of okay, stopping your thought processes. You have to. Learn how to think a little bit more skillfully first before you can stop thinking. Even in the first stages of jhana, there's directed thought and evaluation. It's a type of thinking. It's skillful thinking. It's thinking that keeps you with the breath, keeps you getting more and more absorbed in the breath. But it's still a thinking process, still an intentional process. It's learning how to use your intentions wisely, that you really get in touch with what what your intentions are in the present moment. If you tell yourself you're just going to sort of be with the present moment and not make any intentions, what happens is your faculty of intention goes underground where you can't find it.
It's like saying, okay, I'm just going to let the breath come in and out on its own, and I'm, I'm not going to do anything to influence it. Well, the factors that influence it then go underground. So if you allow yourself consciously to play with a breath, experiment with what is this kind of breathing like, what's that kind of breathing like, you get more and more in touch with what your intentions are in the present moment. And what was used to be an unconscious process becomes a conscious process. When it's conscious, you can see it. See it as in terms of cause and effect. See where it's skillful, see where it's unskillful, and make a difference. You start peeling things away as they come up into sight. So you use the process of fabrication, which in the past you clung to as yourself, and all these narratives you think about. And you turn that same process into a tool to take the narratives apart. Where do these narratives go? Well, they all end in aging, illness, and death. There's no narrative anywhere that doesn't end in those things if you carry it out to its real conclusion. But if you just think in those terms, it starts getting depression, so depressing. So you also use the process of fabrication to create a good state of solid well-being in the mind. That's what we're doing as we use our mindfulness and alertness to get down with the breath, get solidly established here. So there is a real sense of well-being right here, right now. So that when you're letting go of your old attachments, it's now out, not out of aversion or hatred. It's just more out of a sense of growing up. You've got something better to do with your time. And then when you get more and more firmly established in the state of concentration, okay, then you can use, again, you use the your perceptions, use your thought constructs to start taking even that apart, what, what attachment there is to this state of quiet, the state of calm, this sometimes open, spacious state that comes with the concentration. Start taking that apart as well. Then you finally get to the point where they say you incline the mind to non-fabrication. And that's what heads you in the direction of awakening. So there are many steps in this process of peeling away the layers of the onion. It's not that you just say, okay, stop thinking, just put the mind into a, into a meditation technique, like putting it into a factory and hoping the technique will do everything for you. You have to use your own powers of sensitivity. Say, okay, what constructs are skillful, which ones are unskillful? Learn how to side with the skillful ones. And as you take, take your attachments apart and at the same time developing good, strong states of well-being in the mind. And then ultimately, you take apart the path as well, and that's what leaves the, un the unfabricated. Something goes beyond time and space, beyond the present moment. Our, our experience of the present moment is something that's fabricated, too. In fact, it's inter interesting to note that in, when the Buddha explains dependent origination, Sankara fabrication comes before the other kind is it comes before awareness of the six senses. It's this, this is one of the reasons why it's so difficult to uproot this process, because it is so basic, it lies so deep in the mind. Even before we experience things in, at the eyes and the ears and the nose and all our other senses, there are little narratives that go on in the mind that make sense of everything before we've even experienced it, filter things out before they even get to us. This is why this is such a difficult process to uproot, because it is so basic and lies so deep. So what we do is we turn around and we learn to use the process in a more skillful way. So it leads not to aging, illness, and death, but it leads out of them. That's the skill that the Buddha taught.
this is one of the reasons why the question of perspective is so important, because it's, it's prior to everything else. This is why we have to drum it into our minds every day, aging, illness, and death, separation, and the principle of karma. So that becomes the ordering principle in our lives. That becomes prior to everything else. So as the mind processes experience, it's got this little reminder that don't let yourself get carried away, because if you let yourself get carried away, this is where things end up. And it keeps the mind headed in the right direction. Because if it's not headed in the right direction, it's headed all over the place. The process that we call samsara doesn't go in any particular place at all. It just keeps circling around, back and forth, and then tying itself up in knots and going off someplace else and coming back. It doesn't really go anywhere. The only dire real direction there is in life, if you decide to give yourself a direction out of the process, ending the process, using the process to deconstruct itself, and then you're free. 